King of creation, our Savior, Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Welcome to God's house this morning. And as we said a few weeks ago, the center of the universe. Wherever Jesus comes to us in word and sacrament, that truly is the center of the universe. So welcome and we pray the Holy Spirit will lift up your thoughts tonight. And I hope that everybody will get a chance, maybe around 9 o'clock, to go out and look in the sky and look at the planet Jupiter. Saturn and Jupiter are moving toward the southeast. We're going to mention something in the sermon why Jesus created Jupiter just for you and for me. So we'll look at jumping Jupiter tonight and see what Jesus has in store there. So great to have you in God's house. And a uh, couple of announcements. We have Bible study tonight on Philippians. We'll be finishing up with chapter 4. Uh, probably, not probably, we won't have Bible study the Sunday after. We have a circuit meeting in Sioux Falls that evening. And then the week after, I will be in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, performing the wedding ceremony for my uh, niece, uh, Kayla. So uh, we won't have Bible study for two weeks. But tonight we're going to kind of celebrate and do some fun things, 7 o'clock, as we wrap up Philippians. Our football team did very well again. And Logan, we heard you had a good game. And they said you played so well, they wouldn't even let you play anymore. You were a dominator. <laughs> yeah, wow. So good deal. Great to have you here this day. Um, let's see. Oh, a BLT, a big little thing. Uh, on the 6th of September, we'll be taking a special offering for food for the poor. Food for the poor. And I really love that organization. And uh, I hope you will be able to give very thoughtfully and generously for this. Uh, this is literally helping people who don't have enough food to eat each day. Um, and uh, what it does especially is a lot of food that a lot of generous people have given to help people in the Caribbean, Caribbean, Haiti, very poor places like that. But it costs a lot of money to get that free food there. And that's what we will be helping with. So give some thought and prayer and give generously as the Holy Spirit uh, moves you. I hope to, in behalf of uh, this congregation and the other congregation personally, to give a very generous amount uh, to thank God for you. And when I write the note to them, I'm going to say, I'm giving out a love for Jesus and the wonderful two congregations that I uh, am privileged to serve. Today we're going to look at the sensation of creation and how we are not the random jazz dance of the molecules, but we are the crown of God's creation that Jesus has made. Our opening hymn, 790, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Things Rise. We turn to page 184, Divine Service, heading 3. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant unto us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and he has demonstrated this by giving his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become the children of God, and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. We turn to the front part of our hymn book, Psalm 138, and give praise and thanks to God for all that he has done. We will read Psalm 138, verse by verse, responsively, and join in on the Gloria Patri. And the Gloria Patri is very, very important because that's how scripture begins, because the very first time God's name is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, it's plural. For the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down before your holy temple, and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted all things in your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord of the Lord is high, and he regards the holy, but the body he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We open up the inside of our bulletin to pray together the collect of the day. Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. To the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. And uh, Jesse, since you're one of our ushers today, um, after our first reading here, we're going to pause. Would you bring that moose on the loose into God's house so that we can check and see if there's a mouse? 
Okay. <laughs> Would you go get that fat chat just, sir? Thank you, Jesse. He's going to get the moose on the loose. But in the meantime, we're going to hear a wonderful reading of Scripture. And uh, this is a beautiful reading about the gift of righteousness, the gift of salvation, the gift of a brand new heaven and earth, and Eden coming our way, and much more. And Duane will pause after the verse. Thank you. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, chapter 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment. And they who dwell in it will die like manna. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesse, would you come up with the uh, Musa Nose? Thank you. Boys and girls, uh, can you come up there? If you have any children that would like to come up and see closer, Mr. Moose, come on up. And... Uh, Jesse, I'm going to have you hold him up and show that to the congregation there. Okay, there we go. Mr. Moose on the loose here. Okay, come on up and see Mr. Moose. Don't be afraid. He doesn't bite. Okay, good. We got one brave soul here. So, uh, here he is, Mr. Moose on the loose. My question for you, Liz, would you rather have a moose on the loose or a mouse in the house? Moose on the loose, I think so. Michelle? I think so. Isn't that something? How we are. But this moose here is a very friendly one. He says, Happy birthday, Jesse. <laughs> a talking moose. So we're going to sing happy birthday and celebrate today and God's blessings. How about you, man? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, St. Jesse. Happy birthday to you. Very good, very good, Jesse. And he says, not only happy birthday, Jesse, but he says, be strong in God's grace. So the moose on the loose, he's a pretty good theologian. Be strong in God's grace, and this is the place. Oh, that's okay. Hi. Hi, Dean. Okay, that's okay. So this is interesting. Now I've got a question. Who made the moose? Who made the moose? You know, Adam and Eve tried to do that in the garden, and it didn't go too far. <laughs> okay. Jesus made the moose, and he made the dinosaur in the very beginning. He made the T-Rex, and the T-Rex before sin was friendly. And I think, I believe, well, I'm pretty, pretty sure. I know when we get to new heaven and earth, I'm looking forward to give the T-Rex a hug around the necks and not get bitten. There. So Jesus made the moose, he made the dinosaurs, he made all these animals. And can you imagine in the new heaven and earth, and Jesus is not bound by time and space, uh, what a neat thing that's going to be able to be, where not only we will be in sync, no sickness, no illness, nor anything like that, but all the animals and so many more, a wider variety, because when Jesus died on the cross, as the one who created the whole universe, he's going to have a new creation. And it's going to be wonderful. You won't have to worry about coyotes uh, and things like that. Coyotes will be perfectly behaved in the new heaven and earth. Won't that be cool? Yeah. So there, we thought we should just uh, say hello to Mr. Moose on the Loose and be thankful we don't have a mouse in the house. And with that, Jesse, thank you very much. Okay? Good. God bless. God bless. Wait our second reading. Thank you. The epistle lesson is from Romans.
Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him all things and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, proportion to our faith, if service in our serving to the one who teaches in his teaching, to the one who exhorts in his exhortation, to the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We rise for the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say the Son of Man is? Or who do people, excuse me, say the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptizer, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus looked them square into the eye and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Jonah means dove, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed it to you. And I tell you that you are Petrus. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell you to tell no one that he was the Messiah. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And I made one reading mistake here in reading this to you, and I apologize. That verse in verse 18, I made a mistake. And I tell you that you are Petrus. It's not Petrus. It's Petre. It's feminine. So it can't align with Peter because Jesus is the foundation of the church. And when I said that, I can't let that go or the Holy Spirit's going to be telling me, why did you apologize? <laughs> okay. So I tell you, you are Petre. And that's with reference to Jesus here and not Peter, which would be Petrus. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In light of so great a gift of salvation from the triune God, we joyfully confess in the words of the Apostles' Creed our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we sing him 811, All oh, That I Had a Thousand Voices. Upon 
house, I said, you know, according to the evolutionists, something like this is supposed to happen by accident. And I think Lois said, yeah, sure. <laughs> Tell us another one. <laughs> But that's the way a lot of scientists think today, sad to say. Whether a beautiful quilt, or a rocket ship, or a skyscraper, a computer, everyone knows that there were designers, builders, and precise measurements and moves to bring into existence the end product. Everybody knows. Sadly, most of our scientists today believe in hocus pocus, the idea that our complex universe and our complex body, which is far more complex than any spacecraft or anything like that, that this happened as an accident. The random jazz dance of the molecules, things getting together on their own. And it goes against known laws of science. That's what's the head scratcher there. We haven't found a missing link. And there's all kinds of problems, but they believe it. And basically, when you go to the college classes, they say, well, everybody believes in it. That's pretty much their argument, that these things happened out of thin air and contrary to the laws of science, by chance, by accident, by the random jazz dance of the molecules. I'm thinking one of the things I'd like to do for our confirmation class this year would be to take the kids into an area where we could find an old junkyard and then get a couple sticks of dynamite and light up those sticks of dynamite and throw it into that junkyard and boom! According to the evolutionists, out could come a 747 jet plane in all its beauty. That's their argument. Sir Frederick Hoyle said, who is an atheist, that's the chance of this happening by chance. In other words, no chance. Absolute zero. And yet they're so confident that it just happened by chance against all the laws of science, yada, yada, yada. Sinclair Lewis said that when you're paid a bunch of money to do good science, it usually doesn't turn out to be good science. The Bible tells us how the universe began. We know it. And good math will support this. Uh, the greatest mathematician from Stanford University, he worked day and night all the time, and he had all these gigantic formulas, and he said, and he wasn't speaking as a Christian, you know, I think it all happened out of nothing. So they finally caught up with the Bible, sort of. In Hebrew, the Bible opens up with seven, that's five, <laughs> seven, <laughs> Hebrew word. Seven is the number of perfection. So verse one, in the beginning God created everything out of nothing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the next verse, two more sevens. Seven, seven, seven. It was perfect, perfect, perfect when God created everything out of nothing. And I translated triune God because 25 verses later in Genesis one, God says, let, listen carefully, us, make man in our image, us in our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And beloved in Christ, there is no ancient religion that runs this way at all. Their gods are little itty bitty dinky gods, <laughs> and they have little local deities, but there's nothing that is like this in literature anywhere. It's totally unique. Now, what you should say, what we should say, when we read, in the beginning God created everything out of nothing, that means salvation is 100% the gift of God. If God made everything out of nothing, John were 100% dependent upon him, right? May I have a Lutheran amen, John? Amen. Okay, thank you. So the triune God makes everything out of nothing. By the way, in the beginning, God made everything out of nothing. Here's your Hebrew word we're going to learn today and say it all together. Bara. Okay? Okay, so one, two, three. Bara. It was a barrage. And that word is used seven times in the book of Genesis. I cannot tell you how beautiful the Bible is. Moses, when he wrote the first five books, it is so mathematically beautiful. There are strings of seven, strings of tens, strings of twelve. It's the most beautiful mathematical thing you ever saw. 
One commentator said that Moses really had to be the greatest mathematician who ever lived. Uh, unfortunately, most of the scholars can't see this, don't know it, and they spend all their time looking for alleged errors in the Bible when they should be seeing these beautiful patterns. You know, it, it's kind of like this. Uh, anybody have a favorite car of theirs? Anybody have a favorite car? Drew, have you got a favorite car? If you could have any car, any vehicle besides a John Deere tractor, what would you have? Pick a car, any car. Okay, yeah, it's a Camaro. Oh, what year? Oh, I, I'm getting too nosy too. Okay. So pick a Camaro, okay? So you got a Camaro, and just imagine you get the best Camaro in the world, and there's a little speck of dirt on it, and you spend all your time looking at that little speck of dirt and not the beauty of the Camaro. Would that be strange? Yeah, it would. By the way, that's a good choice. Rockford on the Rockford pile. That one too. I still, it's sort of on my bucket list, maybe number 12, but you know, I'll get a Camaro. Anyway, I'm deviating here. I don't want to be deviant, so let's go on here. So, at any rate, God created everything out of nothing, the whole universe, whether the angels or our first parents, Adam and Eve, planets and galaxies, dinosaurs and donkeys, the moose on the loose, nothing was an accident. Nor did it take God millions and billions of years to do that. That's a terrible, terrible teaching. It's almost like God's a nincompoop. Oh, what am I going to do? It's going to take billions of years. And it, it pins death on God. Because it means that all these deaths had to take place before God finally got it right. And the Bible says, no, no, no. That's not how it happened. The wages of sin, Adam and Eve, is death, not God. So it's got that wrong too, also there. So God made everything out of nothing, and he did it in six days. And kind of imagine a beautiful cake, six layers, and on the seventh day rest, and on the top of the cake is the crown of creation, the frosting of the cake, Adam and Eve, you and me, and all their descendants. We are the frosting on the crown of God's creation. What a tremendous, exciting thing that is, reality that that is, and it is so contrary to what the world says. You're just dust. You're just dirt. You're just a cosmic accident. Can you see why people are bummed out when you have to listen to that kind of rubbish? And that's what it really is. It's worse than rubbish, but I won't say it unless we're outside what I think it really is, okay? So at any rate, uh, there... The other bad thing about evolution, oh, I mean evolution, the other bad thing about evolution is it causes so much racism. You ever think about that? This ethnic group is superior to that ethnic group and that ethnic group. That's what Hitler ran with. That's what Stalin ran, Stalin ran with, Mao ran with. They murdered all kinds of aborigine people because of evolution. Oh, we gotta get rid of these little people here. They're just primitive. They're the missing link. They actually murdered them, killed them because of evolution. And there are a lot of intellectuals that think that way and they become so hard-hearted that they can't see that God loves variety and they become arrogant and they want to destroy people and at the end of the day it's for money and for power. Sexism comes from racism and you can read it all in literature in the past uh, where women were looked down upon uh, because of some form of uh, evolution and, and all the holocaust there. That stuff is a breeding ground for slaughterhouses to ride roughshod over the more vulnerable people on this planet. Now, big question. Why did God create this universe? Last week we looked at sheer love. He loved you. That's why he created this universe. Unconditional love, infinite love, intimate love. He knew everything about you before the universe was created. And yet, he loved us. That's why he created this universe. Bottom line, in love, in Christ. And it was spectacular. Now, a good question to ask yourself is this. How do we know that the biblical account is the correct account? There are other ancient accounts of the creation of the world. They're not as coherent, they're not as reserved, they're not nearly as careful as the biblical account. They have some of the elements in, 
um, you know, but they don't have anything at all like the Bible. How do we know we have it right? We know we have it right because Deuteronomy 34 verse 10 said that Jesus spoke face to face with Moses and said, Moses, this is how I created the universe. So the creator of the universe, the redeemer of mankind, who humbled himself already back then, had face to face talks with Moses. And if you can get your Bibles and see the mathematical patterns in there, you will go gaga Google. The last book I read uh, at night before I go to bed is I trace out the mathematical patterns in the Bible. They're off the chart. I, I wish I could have had a chance to talk to Albert Einstein. I would have said, Albert, look at your Hebrew Bible. You're going to love this. It's better than E equals MC squared. So, Jesus and Moses talked face to face. And it was the very same Jesus who appeared in the burning bush, 1500 BC. It was the very same Jesus, 1900 BC, who appeared to Abraham and Sarah and said, Hey, I'm going to give you a miracle baby boy. And Sarah was 90 years old. Imagine that. Someone who's 90 years old today having a baby. Jesus created the universe out of nothing so he could create life in the womb of Sarah. And uh, also, uh, Jesus was present when Abraham went up to the top of Moriah, was going to sacrifice his only son. Jesus steps in, provides a ram because he's the lamb and the great I am. And what does Jesus do? He signifies that he's going to be the one to die at that same place, that same very place, uh, 1900 years later, and it went from Moriah to Calvary. John 1, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1 teaches clearly that Jesus created the whole universe and he holds every cell of your body together. That's the Savior we worship, who reveals the Father and the Son. This creator is also the redeemer, and the Bible teaches that he is the agent of creation, and God's Son literally came to the world to die for you. The creator had to die for you in order to make you and me a new creation. Do you see the connection? Jesus created the universe out of nothing. He dies on the cross for you and for me to make us a new creation. He's, he's double creating here, redemption and creation. It's a wonderful. He, he takes dead stumps and turns us into oaks of righteousness, to use the language of the Old Testament. From being dead in trespasses and sin, we've been made alive in Christ by an act greater than creation. And I wish we could understand that. When a little child is baptized into the body of Christ, that is an act greater than the creation of the cosmos out of nothing. We should be clicking our heels and shouting praise the Lord, but we don't make those connections the way the Spirit, I think, invites us to. Now, by nature, and this happens all the time, by nature we allow bad science, I love good science, we allow bad science, bad philosophy, and bad psychology to enslave us into uh, crass materialism. We hitch our wagons that historically take people over the cliff or into some kind of slavery, one form or another. That's all of history. That's all of history. Only Jesus, the Messiah, can steer us right, set us free, and reveal the meaning of history. He's the only one. Now, think about the power of Jesus and his powerful love for you. First, ponder the power. He made the whole universe. He created our Milky Way and solar system, the Bible tells us. And I want to just give you one example. It's kind of really cool, I think. And tonight, this is your, 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 your assignment, if you'd be so kind. When you look out on the southeast side of the sky tonight, you're going to see Saturn and you're going to see Jupiter. And Jupiter was much bigger this last uh, 30, 60 days. Been watching Jupiter since June. Jumping Jupiter, okay? 
Jupiter is 318, 319 times bigger than planet Earth. It's our big brother, planet Earth's big brother. And what Jupiter does, what Jesus did, is he created Jupiter for us so these asteroids and comets that otherwise would come and take us out and wipe us out, Jupiter takes the hit for us. So Jesus made that. So when you look at it, think of Jesus creating Jupiter 318, 319 times larger, taking the hit for you and for me, Jesus created it, and it's really a picture of how Christ took the hit on the cross for all our sins. And that's the way I think God wants us to enjoy creation connected with salvation and see the mystery, the magic, the miracle, and the wonderful things that are all together there. The greatest hit was when Jesus himself took the hit for our sins on the cross. His body absorbed the pain for every single sin you and I have committed. Creating the universe out of nothing was nothing compared to Jesus taking all of those hits in his body on the cross. By his stripes, a new creation would come forth, and the creation of the universe out of nothing was a rehearsal for the great reversal of what's going to happen to planet Earth here on Earth. So, yes, we're concerned about COVID-19, but we see a much bigger, better, wonderful picture coming, fast coming our way. The world struggles so badly, so sadly, because it follows the terrible teachings of this world that stagger under the weight of survival to fittest. It's not only bad science, but it's caused so much crime and so much corruption and so much antifa and so much bullying and so much holier than thouism. It's such a wicked teaching that not only mocks the love of the Creator, the death of Christ on the cross, but the value of human beings. It, it's just not only horrific science, it's, it's terrible morality. And then along comes with it, the end justifies the means, which tends to make people mean, and the devilish lie that people are a cosmic accident worth nothing. Ugh, that is so evil, and yet that's being peddled in all colleges and universities today as if it's some cool thing and they don't see the bad fruit of it. How radically different the Bible is from Genesis to Revelation. You are not an accident. You are someone very special. God's prized possession, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Creator, Redeemer. God created you by sheer love. Christ died for you out of sheer love and made you a new creation out of sheer love. Here is 777 love overcoming the 666 survival of the fittest dog-eat-dog -dog predator philosophies. And where that love reigns, people celebrate, they rejoice, and beautiful things happen on the face of this planet. In Christ, you are a new creation, a wonderful sensation, heading toward the new heaven and earth, infinitely loved, fully forgiven, and you have the highest hope resting on the perfect record of God's perfect Son and resting on the same power that caused Him to rise from the dead on Easter Sunday. So tonight, if not tonight, maybe tomorrow night, uh, take a look at planet Jupiter and then think about how Jesus created it and then think the one who created it died on the cross for you, rose for you and dwells within you and rejoice and rejoice. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding may guard and keep your hearts and minds in the Redeemer, Creator, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, Jim and Jackie, uh, was that a, a great granddaughter? Emma? Cool. First one. Wonderful, wonderful. And she's having heart surgery this week? Okay, so. Keep Emma in your prayers, and we're going to pray right now. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we thank and praise you that through your strong word, you have revealed to us that we are your dear children, purchased by the blood of your dear Son, the righteous one who created the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the universe, the cosmos, 
As the agent of creation, he caused everything to come into being. As the eternal I am, the great lamb, and he called it out of nothing. We thank you, Lord, that he came into this world to bear our sin and be our savior and grant to us forgiveness, life, and salvation, and a sense of purpose. We thank you that the same Savior literally is by the side of Emma. And we thank you for the gift of this wonderful little girl, grandchild, whose name means Amen. And through your son, the faithful Amen, be with Emma in this surgery, blessing the work of her doctors in Madison, Wisconsin. And Lord, uphold Tammy, the sister of Kathy Griffin, in these uh, challenging days, that you will surround her with those who are able to encourage her, point her to Jesus, and the good doctors that uh, we pray will be uh, restorative hands. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with Herman Stubbe as he went through another heart procedure, and we pray that you will bless his recovery. We thank you, Lord, for our preschool at Zion here, and the wonderful Holy Spirit work that is done that the children learn how richly, infinitely, inextricably they are loved. We pray for the teachers of our public schools also, that you will bless them as they try to bring out the best in the children, teach them valuable things, so they will be good citizens here in time and space. Bless our state leaders, that in their busy, busy schedules, your voice through the word would break into their life and give them a view beyond time and space by grace and all that we now name that are under medical care. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we also pray that you would send rain our way, even as we pray that you will protect people in the Gulf Coast from the two hurricanes knocking on the doors of the Mississippi, New Orleans, Houston corridor. So protect them, and Lord, we pray thy will be done, and when rain does come, Lord, help us to be thankful. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for all the blessings of this day, and now we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We sing our next hymn.
bulletin, and uh, after this hymn citation on page 5, we have Luther's morning prayer. Let us rise. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Before the benediction, this morning, uh, I think there's some plums, Jim and Jeanette, thank you out there, and maybe some other items. Thank you with these past weeks for sharing it with the saints. That's a beautiful thing. Now take into your heart and home the blessing from the God who created the universe out of nothing, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the giver of the Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing this beautiful closing hymn.